there, I can't see everybody. So, um, oh. but <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's just, that's, I, that's um, Zoom. Yeah, I, I would love to give you an introduction, but also, Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third plenary talk of the conference. Um, I do want to give a gentle reminder that the session is being recorded. So if you have a question but prefer not to be recorded, please drop it into the chat and it will be read for you. But it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Shelley Harvey. Dr. Harvey earned her PhD from Rice University in 2002, working with Tim Cochran. She has since spent both time at both UC San Diego and MIT, and she is currently a professor at Rice University, where she continues her research in low dimensional geometry and topology, group theory, and non commutative algebra. Let's all give a warm wel welcome to Dr. Harvey, whose talk is titled When Are Leaks Weakly Concordant to Boundary Links? All right. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really sad I can't be there in person. Um, I love Philadelphia and I have some very good friends there and lots of great mathematicians there, but um, I'm happy at least the conference will resume this year. Um, I, uh, I apologize that I had a little bit of travel issues traveling across the country, so I haven't been able to go to a lot of the talks, um, uh, it, but um, I hope that they're online so I can watch some of them because it looks like a lot of the students are really doing some very interesting work. And so I always want to know about that. Um, but anyway, so let me let me talk about my research here. And uh, this is uh, research with Chris Davis and Joan Long Park. Um, and we're pretty close writing it up. We're pretty close to being in the archives. So if you want more information, you can look at that. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to give this audio. I'm going to give this talk to what I assume is a pretty broad audience in terms of topology and algebra and things. And um, so I, I'm going to start sort of from the beginning and kind of give an overview. I don't want to give too many details on the specifics of, of the specific work, but why maybe it's an interesting question. So that's what I'm going to start with. So um, probably everybody knows what a knot is. Um, there's been some talks of that, but you know, so we want to, we're interested in looking at knots and links. So what is a link? Well, it's just going to be a knot um, with multiple components. So we can say that a link is a knot with multiple components. For this talk, just think about two component links um, and uh, there's, there's for what we're doing, there's not that much difference between two and higher. So, um, and right, a knot is just a smoothly embedded circle in R3 or S3. So this is thought of as an embedding. And often we think we might think about the map or just the subspace. So um, if you're a three manifold topologist, you loves, you should love links. Um, and uh, links and knots are really interesting, right? Because for three manifolds, they, um, they, you can write every three manifold and every four manifold as sort of a wave link. And so they're obviously important, um, but they just come up in a lot of places. They're natural, very interesting subspaces. So um, what are we interested in? So in three dimensions, you're really interested in sort of three dimensional properties of links, in particular, what are the properties that happen as you move the link through a uh, three-dimensional space? So that's when we say they're isotopic. If you can move it, move it around, I guess I need to, I guess this camera is a little higher than I'm used to, booster chair. Um, so you can move it around and just don't intersect itself. That's an isotopy. So it's like a homotopy without self-intersections. So those are interesting. Those are the sort of the interesting equivalence relations of three dimensions. But if you're a four-manifold topologist, and I guess I'm sort of a 3.5 dimensional topologist, you might be more interested in links up to something called concordance. So let me just state not concordance, um, even though we're gonna be interested in links here for motivation, and it's just a little bit easier to state. Okay. So we say that, um, so we're gonna let K and J are knots. Um, or you, you can also do R3 if maybe you're, you know, well, you don't like S3, you don't like compact things or something. But, so if these are knots, 
um, we're going to say that J is concordant to K if K cross zero is concordant to J cross one in S3 cross I. Um, well, okay. What does this mean? Okay, I, maybe we say they're concordant. Maybe I'll just. Sorry, this is being recorded. Oh. My my notes are very small and very hard to read because they're on my phone. <laughs> J is concordant to K if K cross zero co-bounds and a smoothly embedded annulus in S3 cross I. Um, so the picture schematically, you have your picture of R3, kind of look at S3 as R3, which is drawn as R2 in this picture. And, uh, and so you have some knot up here and you have a knot down here. This is, this is you're thinking of this as time zero and this is time one. Um, oh, with, J cross one in S3 cross I. I. I maybe should have just drawn a picture. Okay, and then they bound some smoothly embedded annulus that um, you know doesn't have to be straight. It's just kind of wiggly, but it doesn't have any genera. Okay. And it could have maxes and mins and saddle points, and that's all it's going to have from Morse theory. Let me point out also that everything I'm talking about is in the smooth world. And if you may know some of the things that I work on, that sometimes I work on topological things, but these are really, everything is smooth. There's no weird pathological crazy things going on. Okay, um, so, so smooth concordance, we don't understand that much about it. it is, but we can look at the set. So we're gonna define, oops. So we're defining C, to be the uh, knots modulo concordance. Okay, so it turns out that there's a very nice knot in three dimensions called the unknot, and is the unique knot which bounds a smoothly embedded disk in S3. And so we could ask, what is the equivalence class of that knot in here? Those are going to be called slice knots. So definition one, K, oops, definition two, K is slice or smoothly slice if K is equivalent to J, uh, the unknown. So here's the unknown. Okay, so, um, so that is one element in this, this is one equivalence class in this set. And we would like to understand the set. It turns out this actually has a group structure with connected sum. So this is actually an abelian group. And it's not finitely generated. Um, and um, so, and, 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 and the, you know, the operation for the abelian group is something called connected sum, where you just take two knots, um, I'll probably only draw like trefoils until the actual examples because so here, this is K and J. And then when you connect them up, you get K connects on J. It doesn't matter where you connect them, but um, because you can sort of make a knot small and move it around. Okay, so, um, so one thing that's interesting, I mean, you might think, okay, um, this is some group, we have the trivial element. So K is slice. So this is the trivial element. 
Namely, if you connect some with the unknot, you get the unknot, and this is well defined in terms up to connected sums. And um, and so you might ask, okay, can we? Uh, you know, you might think if you like groups and stuff. If you're thinking about finally presented groups, you might think, okay, well, um, can you write down a presentation? Well, no, um, we don't really know that much about this group. You might think. Uh, can you detect if something is slice, if it's the zero element given a knot? So question given a knot k is k slice, smoothly slice. So this is a question we cannot answer for a particular k even. Uh, I mean, we can answer it for some. We know in some examples of knots that are slice, we know examples of knots that are not slice. But uh, if you just hand me your favorite knot and it's not in the tables and I can't immediately see how to slice it, it's, it's going to be pretty hard. It might be pretty hard to show that it's not slice. And in particular, there's absolutely no algorithm to determine if a knot is slice. There's no algorithm to determine if a knot is ribbon, which is more of a three-dimensional condition. Um, and the, uh, I won't say what ribbon is, but it's basically you have a, you don't have any, um, maxima, you only have sort of minima to the unknot. So uh, it turns out one other definition of being slice you can think of, you kind of take this uh, S3 cross I and, and put a hole in it, put a tube in it, and then connect the knots through that tube. And so we can see that, that K is slice if and only if K is the boundary of a disk, D is homeomorphic to this, a two disk and it lives inside of B4. Um, and so the knot is sort of fixed. So here's a picture of this schematically is here's your knot. Okay, so now it's in lower dimensions, so it's an S0 instead of S1. So this is just really schematic. Here's your disk D. The outside is S3. Uh -oh. And this is the boundary of B4. And so, um, so, you know, not slicing questions come down to questions about, um, I mean, concordance questions come down to questions about not slicing because we have an abelian group. And so if you wanna know two are the same in the, in the group, you can just look at the, the sum of them and know, I mean, the difference between them and look and see if it's slice. So sometimes it's a little bit easier to think of this point of view, instead of a relative question, you have an absolute question. Um, okay, so what, so maybe you might think, well, doesn't look like I can slice the trough well. I mean, like I don't really see any reason why that should bound a disc. Um, but you might think of um, trying to get a disc by uh, you know taking some kind of guy here, and you might want to uh, change that crossing to make it the unknot. And when you do a crossing change through time, if you're doing it through time, you get a homotopy and S3 cross I. Um, and then you can cap it off with a disc. And that homotopy has self-intersections, unfortunately, though. And Friedman's work basically tries, you know, tell you when you can like do surgery in four dimensions. So it might help you trying to figure out when things are topologically sliced, and it does. Um, but smoothly slice, you kind of have to just find a slice disk usually. I mean, you can't just like compute something and say it's slice, right? So it turns out the trefoil is not slice and, the, and that homotopy doesn't work. So here's some examples. And I'll tell you why in a second why the trefoil is not slice. Oh, and if you're not a topologist, the trefoil is the simplest knot. This happens to be the left-handed trefoil, and there's the mirror image. If you switch all the crossings, it's the right-handed trefoil. Okay, and the reason it is is some signatures are non-zero. It's sort of non-zero signatures. 
Okay. Um, but what are some examples of knots that are actually slice? Well, something called ribbon knots are slice. So um, what is a ribbon knot? So for example, um, yeah, let me take my favorite ribbon knot, which will be the 946 knot. Maybe I'll go to a different page so I have more room. Okay, so, um, so ribbon knots are slice. Um, so here's my, well, I don't know, stevedore is pretty nice, but this is a pretty simple um, picture of a genus one, not one, two, three. Okay, so here is, okay, so here, here is a genus one knot. You can kind of see that there's a surface that's sort of filled in if you look carefully, but you can ignore that. Um, uh, and so, you know, there are many ways to see that this is slice. One is you could show that it's ribbon. Um, so let me tell you, I, I won't say, tell you what ribbon is, but I'll show you a picture. So uh, what you can do is, well, maybe I'll show you the, the easier picture um, where we just do some movie moves. Cause I think I, I do a kind of bad job of drawing the ribbon. So I'll give you a different proof. Okay, so let's think of this picture as we move it through time. So we're thinking of this is in S3 cross zero. And what we want to do is we want to do some moves on it so that it gets down to like the unknot or something we can, cat, you know, something that's we know a slice. And so let's see. So what we can do this is we can start isotoping uh, the guy through time. So I'm going to draw this little picture here. Copy. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to start off here, and this is t equals zero, and then I'm going to change it. Uh oh. Copy that again. And so at t equals one, maybe I'll just take this guy and I'll, instead of having to go straight, I'll make it come closer together. You probably can't. Can you guys see what I'm drawing? Okay. Um, so this is like t equals maybe 0.5 or something, some time equals one, whatever. So you're just moving through. Oh, I guess I went from S, S3 to zero to one. So, okay, let's say like one fifth. Um, and then we can take and move these curves. So these curves are never intersecting each other because they're a different slice of time. So, you know, this is really like level sets you should think about from calculus. Um, so at t equals, you know, one quarter or something, we can basically make these intersect one another and they come together and there's a singularity. So you think, well, that's not nice because it's not a knot. But um, what are you doing here is you're just building, you're starting with the knot up here. Schematically, you have this knot. So this is t equals zero. And then um, what, you, what you're doing now is you're going down to a point where you get a, a, a saddle. So, um, okay, I don't think I can draw the, I don't think I can draw a saddle with the rest, without the rest of the pants, so I'll do that. Um, and so this, this point here is like T equals um, like, one quarter or something, uh, one quarter. And so here you see that you're getting this pinch thing. So this is T equals one quarter. And, um, and so what is this other part down here? Well, if you start smoothing, you start smoothing this, 
then you can smooth it in the direction you came with, which is not gonna get you anywhere, or you can smooth it in the other direction, which is what I'll do. And, oops. Right, and then, um, and this, this turns out to be the unlink, which is this guy here. And uh, the unlink bounds two disks. So we can put them in here. And so what you can see is this is just a, an embedded disk. And you're probably saying that doesn't look very smooth in my picture, but you can do everything in a smooth fashion and smooth everything. Okay, so this is the 946 knot. Um, one thing is it's not the unknot to begin with, you might ask that because, um, so this is uh, not the unmod. Um, for example, the Alexander polynomial is not one. Uh, if you know what that means. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, it's fundamental group. The, fun the complement of the fundamental group is not Z, which it would need to be for, um, so you can just compute, like averting your presentation, find out the fundamental group and show that it's not the unmod. But. I'm sure there are many ways people know how to show things aren't done that. Okay, so that is the that's that's what a slice knot is. And so we're kind of interested in this weird equivalence relation. And it turns out that link slice questions are very related, in fact, to um, questions uh, about surgery working in four dimensions and things, but um, they actually came up much earlier. Um, they came up when people were studying singularities of complex curves. And, you know, if you have a singularity, um, so if you have some curve, let's say this is in C2, um, and maybe it comes back around somewhere, and you have, if you have some singularity, you can look at that singularity right here, and you can try to understand what the link of it is. So, here, this is uh, schematically a copy of B4. And the boundary turns out to be a knot or link. So this is the link of the singularity. And uh, so Milner studied this. And so the question was like, if you have an algebraic surface, um, algebraic curve, sorry, I'm a topologist, so surfaces are two dimensions. Sorry if there are any algebraic geometers out there. Um, and so, you know, if you want to get rid of that singularity and you want to have something that's a smooth manifold, then um, you might think, well, let's remove the singular part. That's just this little ball. And then let's plug in another ball with a new surface that whose boundary is the same length. And in particular, you'd like to have things that are maybe not adding any genera. You'd like to add genus zero guys. And so you would need the link to be slice in order to do this. Um, so can we replace the singularity with smooth disks? One for each component. Um, so that was a question they asked. And it turns out like this answer is really no. Like we can classify, these are all like um, iterated torus knots and stuff. And so, so these really are kind of robust. These te tend to be very opposite of being sliced. So like this wasn't very useful, um, but it, it did start people studying this, um, this question, which turned out to be very relevant in some of Friedman's work, but um, okay. So this was hmm, like the 60s or something, I don't know, 50s, something like that. Um, and people, you know, Milner started looking at, in fact, he was the person I believe that gave the first example of a knot that was not sliced using a signature. And I'll talk about what these signatures are in a second. Oh, is this an hour talk or 15 minutes? This is this an hour? Okay. I can't hear anybody, but if someone wants to yell out at some point. Um, it's an hour. Yeah. Okay. 
great, thank you. <laughs> you guys are just as bad as the students. Like, can someone, anyone, anyone? I'd be interested to know who gets that reference. I know Dave must. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so that, so anyway, so let's move out of the world of singularities and get back to four dimensional topology here. Um, so, Levine was really the person that started studying uh, not concordance. In fact, he studied not concordance and not just dimension three, but in all dimensions. And so what his work did, I won't, I won't say everything he did, I'll mostly talk about three dimensions here, um, is that he defined an infinite number of invariants by looking at some VIT class of um, a quadratic form. And so what does this quadratic fo form come from? It comes from something called a cipher matrix. So um, this is related to, but I, 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 do, I do want to motivate why I'm asking the question I am. So, so I, I hope I'm not boring too many people. I'm assuming not everybody knows about cipher circles. So um, if, if I'm boring everyone because everybody knows this, please let me know. And please ask questions too, because I don't really like talking to myself. So, um, okay. So a ciphered surface is a two-sided or oriented, I guess it just has to be orientable surface in S3 with, I guess it's embedded. Somehow um, my, my writing noise gets very sloppy when I write this definition <laughs> with uh, the boundary of the surface is or not. Um, so this is a ciphered surface for the knot. And um, it turns out you can define all these very interesting invariants using the ciphered surface once you find because it gives you something called a ciphered form. So from sigma, so this is, you know, you're given some not K and then you have this surface and you think, well, that's not very helpful. Probably that's a topological object. We don't know how to do anything with that. So then you say, okay, well, let's take a surface and take it and make it into a matrix because those are awesome. And so we're gonna look at some matrix um, V. So this is called the ciphered matrix. And uh, the idea behind this, let me just say, is that you take a symplectic basis for your surface. Your surface has one boundary component, but can be solved with symplectic basis. And then you look at the linking numbers between those basis curves, represent them, represent them by curves on the surface. And then you look at a linking matrix from them. So for example, on, um, so here's a picture, here's an example. That is, oops. Um, this is my favorite way, I guess, to draw these surfaces in disband form. Okay, so I'm going to do this and then I'm going to put some twists. Um, Maybe that's, okay, these twists may be the opposite direction, but it, uh, I guess I should do the same. Okay, so this turns out to be the trefoil. Um, whether, I always forget whether, I think this is the right-handed, no, is this the left-handed or, okay, this is, I don't know, it's either left or right handed truffle. Let's pretend like those uh, crossings look. So basically these entries is, you know, this one comes from looking at this element of the basis. So let's call that X one, and then, or let's just call it X and Y. And then this is Y. 
So these are curves representing a symplectic basis of the surface, and you should put some orientations on them. Um, so there are some choices, and there's a choice of cipher surface. So the fact that you have one twist in these bands, that twisting says you have a self-linking of one, or it might be negative one how I draw it, drew it because I don't. So you know, if you want, you can put plus or minus one. And then there's a one that's basically, you might say, oh, I can't look at the linking between orange and pink because they intersect. Well, it turns out you can look at pushing one off in one way and then pushing the other off in that way. And then you get two entries and you don't get a symmetric matrix. So basically this is like, if you push the pink up above the orange, you get a one there. If you push the pink below the orange, you get a zero. And so those are the ones and zeros. So, um, so if you're an algebraist, you may be like, oh, I don't like this at all. This is not symmetric. That's not a quadratic form. And we do want to get some sort of quadratic forms. So, um, so this is V in this case, but it's not symmetric. So what you can do is you can look at, um, you can look at V plus V transpose, and this is going to be symmetric uh, unimodular. It turns out it's unimodular for knots, um, symmetric unimodular matrix. So in other words, it's a quadratic form. And this is over Z. Okay. And, um, but in general, you lose a lot of information. So more generally, um, you could also do one minus omega V plus one minus omega bar V transpose. And this is Hermitian um, for any omega that is on the unit circle and C. Um, you could also think of it as a variable omega and think of it as a form. So um, anyway, so basically, uh, um, so Levine studied the VIT, I mean, he studied basically uh, the VIT group of, um, of this sort of, uh, Z of, well, let, let's be sloppy. Let's not write plus or minus. So a bit Z of omega. Um, so these are like polynomials in omega. So, um, and then it's really over the variable T, but um, anyway, so, and then use this to um, find an infinite number of not concordance invariants. So basically, I'm not gonna give you the details, but you can map, you have a map from C to A of C, let's say. So this is the algebraic concordance group, which is a bit group of forms, of quadratic forms over, well, really it's, Let's, let's, let's say, I mean, you really look at the fields. Um, so, um, well, let's just say over something because I, I don't want to get into details. It's a little bit complicated. Anyway, so you get, the idea is you um, take your knot, you take your cipher surface, you get this matrix and you can look at one minus omega V plus one minus omega bar V transpose. And then if you think of this, it's, it's you know, in, um, it's, it's an element, it's, it's in C, it's a matrix over C. But really we wanna think of it as a matrix over Q of T and then do some stuff. Anyway, after like a long time or after much work, um, basically he was able to prove that the algebraic concordance group was isomorphic and, you know, um, so, so what Levine showed, oh, and this is a homomorphism that's surjective, right? So, um, every, um, let's see, 
the algebraic concordance group is isomorphic to Z infinity plus Z mod two infinity plus Z mod four infinity. And um, yeah, and so this is by studying these quadratic forms um, and basically getting a bunch of different quadratic forms that depend on omega and then analyzing each of these by looking at um, things over, you know, ba basically looking at um, p addicts and extending them and, and looking at signatures. So it turns out, so the trefoil has a non-zero z. So these are all, if, you, if you've heard of these things, these are signatures, Levine-Tristam signatures. Um, so the first person to do the signature um, was Milner, but he was just looking at A plus A transpose, sort of the basic case. And so that's the standard. Um, so anyway, uh, and it wasn't until this, so this was in the 80s, 60s, sorry. And really he did this work in all dimensions. And it turns out that in higher dimensions that the concordance group is actually isomorphic to the algebraic concordance group. And it completely determines um, the knots up to concordance. And in fact, for two knots in four space, everything is concordant to the unknot. Everything is trivial in even dimensions, but okay. So that's an aside. Um, and the, there was a big open question as to whether or not uh, C was isomorphic to the algebraic concordance. Is C algebraic or is there something more going on? And so those are examples of, this is Kasson and Gordon. And this was in the 80s, I guess. Um, that um, there exist knots that are algebraically slice, but not smoothly, oh, sorry. Yeah, smoothly slice. So algebraically slice just means that it's trivial in that bit group. So. Okay. Um. And if you're interested, I mean, so if you're if you're not studying quadratic forms, remember that basically this thing is going to be zero. So note, I didn't really define everything clearly, but it's easy to talk about the zero element. So k is algebraically slice. It turns out, so this is a well, this is a theorem doing. Okay, this is really a theorem. Due to Kirton. Is it this? Uh, is this due to Kirton, I think? Um, yeah, I, I don't have as many books and things to look stuff up since I've been traveling, but. Um, the, okay, so this is algebraically sliced. Oh, no, this isn't. Oh, sorry, I'm getting confused. This is actually pretty easy to show. If. Um, I was thinking of something stronger. So this is algebraically slice if uh, V, if H1 of the ciphered surface has a basis. Oh, I guess I didn't, I said, I said a symplectic basis for the ciphered surface. I really meant for H1 of the ciphered surface. I apologize for that. Um, has a basis such that the ciphered form has a half block of zeros. So this is G by G, and this is a 2G by 2G matrix where G is the genus of a surface. Okay, so we have a half, this is sometimes called the metabolizer or Lagrangian. So we have this form on which a half basis vanishes. Okay, so that's nice because it, you know, it gives you sort of a very sort of, in some sense, straightforward 
uh, in some sense harder, but um, way to determine if a knot is algebraically sliced. So if you wanted to know if a knot is sliced, you'd first check to see if it's algebraically sliced um, or if it's something you already know. So this, this pretty much like revolutionized, um, you know, not concordance. I mean, we really knew nothing else besides this. So some of these invariants are, you might, are sort of like ARF invariants, some of them are other invariants, but in general, I mean, you may not be able to like, okay, so there's a lot of number theory involved. So if there are number theorists in the audience, that, you know, if this is quadratic forms over some field. Yeah, I guess we're over the field Q of T. And, um, and, you know, and so this can be hard to compute maybe some of these, you know, invariants you might have to know about like hash symbols and things, but I mean, it certainly is easier than understanding things that's concordance. Oh, I should check on the time. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's enough about knots for now. So the point of all this was for knots, we have a cipher surface and that cipher surface is extremely useful in being able to detect if a knot is slice or maybe detect if a knot is slice, you can check if it's algebraically slice. So we would like to, um, so it turns out for knots, you know, we can classify this idea of algebraic concordance, algebraic, and for links, we'd like to do the same. It turns out that's kind of hard. Um, so what about links? Well, if a link doesn't even have linking number zero, if you know what that means, then we don't even have, you know, cipher. So we can't possibly get ciphered surfaces for each of the components. So you might think about, well, let's just take one component um, at a time and, and, oh, sorry, let's take both components at a time. So let's say L is L1 union L2. Then there exists a, um, we could think of it as a, a ciphered surface, but it's really a Z ciphered surface. And I won't tell you why it's called Z, but ciphered surface for L. And that is just a single surface that's orientable two-sided and the boundary of the cell. So you might have like the annulus that is allowed. Um, and so that's a ciphered surface, like the Z ciphered surface, but it's, you could also say, okay, now I wanna know, maybe we'll define what algebraically slices for links um, by saying that, you know, this, the cipher matrix associated to the cipher surface has a metabolizer. Well, this is sort of no good because, uh, and I'm not writing up a lot of details because we're not going, this is the bad thing to study. Um, and because if you look at this guy, um, that shouldn't be algebraically sliced, right? I mean, because each of the components is algebraically sliced. And you might think, okay, well, you know, if a link is sliced, this is, this isn't even, yeah, like neither of these are sliced. This is not algebraically sliced. This is not because of the trefoil, but the matrix you get is just a, it's just, there's no interaction between them. So the matrix has zeros up here um, and has one, one, one. Oh, I guess it's negative one for the left hand or I don't know. Anyway, let, let's just decide it's plus or minus one or maybe my one will be different, my definition. And then you have these zeros and you can see, you know, this has a, a sub module I mean, so you can look at um, the basis, thinking of this as one, zero, one, zero, um, sub basis and zero, one, zero, one is a metabolizer for this form. So, um, so yeah, so you're not going to get 
And the reason is because we don't have to worry about these linkings. And that's the thing that really messes you up a little bit with links. So, so anyway, this, and this definition would be algebraically sliced, but I certainly am not interested in this. So this is sort of giving you a notion of weekly slice, um, where instead of links uh, bounding disjoint things, they, they bound uh, a single guy. Okay, so first, I guess I should tell you when is a, when is one or two links concordant? Well, it's the same thing. They co-bound two disjoint annuli, L1, L2 concordant if they co-bound disjoint embedded, disjoint embedded annuli in S3 cross I. And equivalently, uh, so L is slice if L um, is the boundary of D1 union D2. So I guess L1 is the boundary of D1 um, and L2 is the boundary of D2. And the picture is that you have You know, this is D1 and, um, and then maybe you have a different disk, D2. And the key is they, they're embedded, they're smoothly embedded and disjoint. And so that's, that's you know, if something's gonna be algebraic, a slice, they should maybe be algebraically sliced. And, uh, and so you probably don't want that previous definition. Okay, so um, you could suppose that you have a link If L is the boundary of, um, so let's say if L is the boundary of sigma, where sigma is sigma one, disjoint union sigma two, and these are all inside of S three, then, um, so here, boundary of sigma one is L1, let's say, and boundary of sigma two is L2. And then you can say, um, this is called the boundary link. So, I mean, what is this? Maybe the, the simplest example of a, Boundary link. Okay, well, simple, simplest example one to see is probably the white head. No. Um, I mean, I usually just draw it schematically, but okay. Um, they, they can intersect. Here's a boundary link. <laughs> if you take, anyway, so the basic point is they bound disjointly embedded surfaces. Um, here, here's an example that's a really interesting example, but it's actually pretty hard to see that it's a boundary link. So you take this guy and then you, so you're gonna tie into, let's say the trefoil or a knot, not K. So you sort of make these strings and then you cut them open you tie it into the knot and you re-glue them. But so now you're not doing just one component, now you're doing it with two components and they need to re-glue the start the way they started. So this is an example and the boundary, the, the, the surface is kind of complicated and I, I can talk to people about it afterwards. Um, but anyway, so what's nice about boundary links? Well, they have disjointly embedded surfaces and so we can take this sigma and we can make it into a matrix. So V, and now V is a matrix, it's a form. So this represents a form on H1 of sigma one plus H1 of sigma two. And since it's a direct form, a metabolizer for this 
should be a metabolizer for the whole form that is a metabolizer for each of them. So in other words, um, so this is like, um, this is like from sigma one and this is sigma two, and this is the linking of sigma one and sigma two. So these are the curves on both sides, but it's not symmetric. Um, so anyway, so, uh, so we, we can say that L is, let's say strongly algebraically slice. I mean, there's not really a term for this in, that's used that often, but strongly algebraically slice if L, um, if V uh, can be written in this form where we have zero G by G, G one by G one, you have a zero G two by G two, and, but then you need linking numbers between those two curves to be zero. So, so this is a metabolizer for the big guy that restricts to metabolizers for each individual component. Okay, so that's a definition. Well, here's a question. We don't really know much about this. If L is slice, then is, L algebraically slice strongly. And that is unknown. It is known if you're actually boundary slice is boundary slice. And I, I am not gonna tell you what boundary slice is, but it's a condition that, I mean, basically you have a boundary link and you can, um, if it's slice, you have these disjoint surfaces, these disks in the four ball. And then if you remove those disks, right, then you want to know if, so the, the surfaces give you a map to a free group, surjective, so it's at meridians, go to the generators, and we want to know if that can extend over the, the whole four manifolds. So that's called boundary slice. And much is known for links up to boundary slice. And the question is, is boundary slice the same as slice has been open question since probably the 60s or since Levine's work, people have been thinking about these sort of things. Um, so there's been a lot of work on links up to boundary slice, but that's a much stronger condition in theory. So we don't know if they're the same. Um, okay, but let's, um, but we don't really have any obstructions. We have no reason to believe that maybe this, you know, isn't true. Um, Anyway, so uh, what, what we'd like to do is uh, we would like to understand links in general though. Um, and so if you're interested in concordance questions, you might say, well, okay, what if I have a link that's not a boundary link? Like how do I start? How do I decide if it's algebraically slice? Well, what you can do is first you can check if the Milner's invariants are zero. Those all have to vanish for, um, and I'm not gonna go into what those are, but they're like Massey products, um, if you know what those are. Um, and uh, so finite type invariance, if you know what that is. But um, so the Milner's invariants all vanish, then you, then you have to ask, well, now what I do? Now I still don't have a boundary link. So you might say, oh, maybe I can take my link I have and I can decide that it's concordant to a boundary link. And then the concordance class I can represent by the boundary link and not have to worry about my original link. So the big question in the early nineties or before that was that, um, you know, are all links concordant to boundary links? Are all links with vanishing Milner's invariants concordant to boundary links? And that was proved to not be true by Cochrane and Orr. So there exist links with all um, Milner's invariant zero. So these are these mu bar, which are basically, so what these do, these measure how far 
in the lower central series. of um, pi one of S three minus the link. Um, so how far in the lower central series of this does the longitude lie? So you can look at the fundamental group and some object we know how to study you can study something called the lower central series quotients and for knots those are not interesting but for links it's very interesting and it turns out that you can um, you can basically use something called Stallings theorem to define these and um, so Milner did this in the for I think he did as an undergraduate actually I'm not sure but he did something as an undergraduate and this might have been it um, okay that so there exist links where all the previously known invariants vanished, essentially, that are not concordant to boundary links, to a any boundary link. So that's not good. Um, so that was a while ago, and this was uh, in like 93, it was published. Um, and uh, it was actually um, somewhat independently proved by, um, uh, I'm, I'm getting old and forgetting people's names. Um, Livingston, sorry. I, I kept wanting to say licorice, but okay. Um, so let's see. So where are we now? So I haven't talked about any of our work. And so quickly, we, there's something called the insolvable filtration, which is an equivalence relation on links. And so um, I'm not gonna say what it is, but it's a, it's a filtration of the knot concordance group that gives you a filtration on knots. And then we can look at an equivalence relation generated by that. And so we wanted to ask, um, is there a weaker condition where we can show that every link is sort of weakly equivalent in that sense to a boundary link. And then at least you could understand this original link up to like n solvability or something like that. You at least know more than you know now. Well, it turns out, um, it, it turns out that even if you kind of go very, very, very weak, there are links with all vanishing Miller's invariants that are not concordant, that are not n solvably concordant to any boundary link. So um, here is the specific theorems. I can draw a picture. Um, okay, sorry, I need to get my. Okay, so um, for each n greater than or equal to oh uh, one. There exists links that are something called n-solvable. That basically means they're getting closer and closer to looking like a slice. In particular, slice links are all concordant to boundary links because they're concordant to the unlink. So um, that's a very that's a very special case of this. So for each n greater than one, there exists links that are n-solvable but not n point solvably concordant to a boundary link. Okay, and so the, the picture, it's very constructive theorem. Um, I can draw a picture if people want, but I wanna state the other theorem um, because I'm running very low on time now. And so, um, basically what this says is we can put this much weaker equivalence relation on, on links called n solvably equivalent. And like you basically can't even find, there are examples where you're not even like 1.5 solvably equivalent to a boundary link. Um, it turns out if you go below that, then um, so every uh, link, is zero solvably equivalent to a boundary link. 
Um, and that was due to my, my student, it was a, this is a corollary of a student of one of my students, Martin, Taylor Martin. Um, uh, and then also that, um, so the, well, okay, I, I, let's just do, this is due to Martin, but before we ask this question. Um, so the main theorem, the sort of most interesting theorem that's related to what we're talking about today is the following that says for each K, there exists a zero solvable link with mu bar equal to zero for all I. Um, oh, sorry, for I less than or equal to K. So not all of them, but a bunch of them up to a certain level um, where the components are slice and L is not solvably 0 0.5 solvably concordant to um, a boundary link. And the, the way we do this is looking at some Blanchfeld forms and sort of algebraic information and then producing examples that don't set that don't satisfy obstruction. Um, so let me say why the 0 0.5 is interesting. Well, it turns out for knots, for knots, um, like K is 0 0.5 solvable is equivalent to being algebraically slice. And this is, there's some pretty hard work that goes into this, but eventually if you wanna find it, it's in the paper by Cochrane or Teichner um, on, on the unsolvable filtration. So, so really the point of this is we would, we would have liked to um, study 0.5 solvability. And, and one of the big questions that I'm interested in is what is the relationship between 0.5 solvable for links and being algebraically sliced? And we have some directions, but um, we don't even know the answer for, um, for boundary links, in fact. Um, and so, and anyway, uh, so this is, so basically this theorem about 0.5 solvable is not what we wanted, but it, it is what it is, it's math. So, um, but I think I'm gonna stop here. All right, let's all give Dr. Harvey a big thank you. Are there any questions? Um, you mentioned a picture for the first theorem. I'd definitely be interested in yeah, seeing so, that. Okay, so the second picture is a little bit easier. So the one that's zero solvable and not is just our little friend 946 on one component, which is slice. And then, and then the other component is this. So the blue is sliced because this is an unknot, and the white is sliced is the 946. And this turns out to be zero solvable um, by my student's thesis. And then, um, so it turns out this is not solvably concordant to any, um, yeah, to any boundary link. Um, 0 0.5 solvably concordant. Um, so, uh, and then, so, but this thing has non-trivial Miller's invariants. So this isn't quite the example. And what you have to do is you have to take this, this is not concordant. You wanna change it subtly so that the Milner's invariants become vanishing and um, kill off as many mu bar invariants as possible. And you can do that while still being able to use the Blanchfield form obstruction that we're using. So, but that, that's kind of the example, that's a pretty easy example. The other examples are unsolvable. Turns out there's this recursive point of view. Actually, I'll just steal this because it's very similar. 
So in, in the in the other theorem, take this out. I mean, somehow this is always like a, a base case. You want to start with a, a slice knot and change it around to, to have some properties. Um, so uh, we're going to tie in K. And then we're going to have the other component here. Okay, so this is this is component two, like component one, and so it turns out that yeah, so these um, these are going to be vanishing Miller's invariants because they turn out to be a sublink of a homology boundary link, which is the largest class of links that are known to vanish for Miller's invariants. Um, it's a lot of open questions, but I shouldn't shouldn't ask right now. And K is some suitable. suitable knot, <laughs> um, but K specifically is formed by um, taking this guy what we want to do is, um, so this is like, so what we want to do is we want to look at R of J R R. So this is, you can think of this as an operator going from knots to knots and you tie in K and you get another knot. And so this is called a pattern operator. And then um, these are just satellite operators, but they're very useful in concordance. And so you do this N times. And so you're re-embedding it over and over in itself. Um, and then it, you know, uh, okay, that, that's not quite true. Um, you have to change that a little bit. So you, you don't want to have the L1 in there. But um, anyway, so that's the idea of how you would get these. But if you were to draw these, they would have like for N large, you're, you know, you're probably the crossings certainly are going to grow exponentially with N. So it's going to be a pretty crazy looking thing. So, um, I, I, if there, if, you know, if there are people that are interested in algebra, you might ask what the solvable stands for. And it has something to do with um, the, and the, the solvable filtration of the drives, you know, the drive series of the fundamental group of the four manifolds. So that's where the solvable comes in. It's really looking at covering spaces, um, if you like those. Anyway, that's. For the uh, not concordance, uh, for the for the filtration on not concordance, there's this huh? geometric picture, you know, where you have like the the gropes or the the Whitney towers. Uh -huh. Is there yeah. any sort of similar picture for links? I imagine it would be much more. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very interesting question because there's these two sort of filtrations. One's from Miller's invariance and Whitney towers. Um, and, and those things for boundary links are not very interesting. So it's a little bit different, um, but those basically are, yeah. So uh, Peter Teichner and, um, and uh, uh, Rob Schneiderman and Jim Conant. So they have this series of papers where they basically show that um, Miller's invariants are complete obstruction or Miller's invariants and some potentially higher, higher or ARF invariants are complete obstructions to bounding some kind of Whitney towers. Um, and there are Whitney towers involved in the solvable world. They're just different. <laughs> so it turns out that like the Whitney towers they're interested in look much more like lower central series where you're sort of dividing off and only in one direction. And so the, the gropes that are more relevant for these are the Whitney towers or, or sort of trees that are symmetric trees. So you have like a node and then you split into two and those split into two and you have like this symmetric version. Um, so it's a lot harder to detect if something bounds a symmetric group than a non-symmetric group. Um, it, it's just, you know, you think it's, well, it's just a few more things, but it's, it really makes it a lot harder. So, but that's a good question. It would be interesting to understand more about the relationship about the two.
Um, does that answer your question? Sorry, Ryan, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, I was having trouble finding, I was scrolling yeah. because I can't see everybody. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Are there any more questions? Okay, let's uh, thank Dr. Harvey one last time.